global warming and climate change, phenomena that can no longer be denied. Among the causes are greenhouse gas emissions. So alternative energy is a bigger issue than ever and increasingly a focus of business and scientific attention. This trend is also generating new interest in an invention that dates back 190 years. The Stirling engine, named after its inventor, Reverend Robert Stirling. Robert Stirling was born on the 25th of October 1790 near the Perthshire village of Methven in Scotland. His contact with engineering started at an early age. In 1756, his grandfather Michael had developed the first rotary threshing machine for agriculture. Helping his father maintain and service the machines, young Robert showed a keen interest in anything mechanical. From 1805 to 1808, he attended Edinburgh University, where he studied Latin, Greek, logic and mathematics. A year later, he switched to Glasgow University to study divinity and law. Graduating on the 4th of July 1815, he was ordained a minister of the Church of Scotland, a vocation which he followed till his death in 1878. In the first half of the 19th century, Europe underwent a technological, economic and social transformation. In the early days of the Industrial Revolution, working conditions were appalling. And Stirling witnessed them at first hand in his parish. In the coal mines, new high-pressure steam engines were introduced to drive pumps for extracting the mine water. The human cost was high. The boilers frequently exploded and claimed many lives. Among the victims, children as young as six forced to work in the mines. Driven by the idea of making the miners work safer and easier, Robert Stirling sought to develop a machine that would operate at much lower pressure and without dangerous steam. Although the principles of thermodynamics were not yet known, Stirling was aware that gases expand with heat and contract with cold. This can be demonstrated by a simple experiment. If a paper lid is placed over a jar of hot jam, the air inside the jar is heated. This causes it to expand in the jar and force the lid to belly outwards. But if the jar is placed in cold water, the air inside cools down and contracts and the lid curves inwards. Stirling was inspired to design a machine that exploits this property of gases. The principle on which it works has been known since antiquity. In the second century BC, the scholar Hero of Alexandria developed a machine for opening temple doors automatically. When a visitor lit a votive fire, the heat spread to a sealed underground tank half filled with water and caused the air inside it to expand. The resulting pressure forced the water through a pipe into a bucket. Because of the weight of the water, the bucket descended, pulling a rope that opened the doors. When the fire went out, the air quickly cooled and contracted. A partial vacuum was created. The water in the bucket was sucked back into the tank and a counterweight closed the doors. Like Hero's hot air machine, Robert Stirling's invention exploited the property of air to expand with heat and contract with cold. 
On the 27th of September 1816, he obtained a patent in Scotland for a hot air machine that was later to become known as the Stirling engine. This is how it works. A sealed cylinder is exposed to a continuous source of heat from below. The air in the lower part of the engine gets hot, expands and pushes a piston upwards. Now the hot air needs to be cooled again. This is done by adding air fins to the farthest point from the flame and getting the air to flow towards them. So the air at the bottom needs to be displaced, a task that's performed by another piston, which displaces the air as it descends and forces it up to the air fins. There the air cools and contracts and the power piston returns to its starting point. Now when the displacer piston makes space for the air at the bottom, the air is reheated and the cycle starts again. To ensure coordinated movement, the power piston and the displacer piston need to be precisely synchronized. This is achieved by coupling the two pistons with a flywheel. The piston rods are anchored in such a way that the pistons move in perfect coordination through each stage of the operation. While the power piston travels upwards due to the expanding hot air, the displacer piston remains virtually motionless. Then the displacement of air to the cold end of the cylinder begins. Finally, the two pistons return to their starting points. The cooled air is displaced downwards to be heated and the cycle starts all over again. Robert Stirling's hot air engine was a safe alternative to the steam engine because the internal pressures involved were much lower. Coal was needed only to provide the required heat. But apart from being a great deal safer than the steam engine, Stirling's invention was more fuel efficient, reason enough to develop the new technology further. The first Stirling engine was used in Ayrshire in Scotland to pump water from a quarry. By 1840, Robert and his brother James, an engineer and foundry manager, had developed and patented a number of improvements to the Stirling engine. In March 1843, a 34 kilowatt unit was built to drive all the machinery at the Dundee Foundry Company. Four years in operation, it consumed only a third as much fuel as the steam engine it replaced. Its efficiency ratio, 18%, was never matched in the 19th century. The steam engine in those days managed less than 10%. Robert Stirling was not an industrialist, so he spent no more time developing and marketing his idea. He attended instead to his duties as a clergyman. Robert Stirling remained a Presbyterian minister for the rest of his life. He died on the 6th of June 1878 at Galston in Ayrshire. He was nearly 88. But his idea, the Stirling engine, lived on. At the dawn of the 20th century, around a quarter of a million Stirling engines were in use worldwide as fans, pumps or drive units for small pieces of equipment. They supplied private households and small businesses with mechanical power. Their advantage was that they needed only heat to work, so any combustible material could be used. But as internal combustion engines and electric motors became more efficient and widespread, Stirling engines gradually disappeared from the market. Then, in 1937, a number of companies started looking at the Stirling engine as an option for generating electricity in remote areas.
Today, there are various types of Stirling engine. One of the most widespread is the Alpha type. Here, the engine is comprised of two separate cylinders and two power pistons, one hot and one cold, connected by a pipe. The left cylinder head is exposed to a heat source. The one on the right is cooled by air fins. In the first phase, the left cylinder is heated and the expanding air pushes the left piston down. Then the right piston moves down. The hot air is sucked into the cold cylinder and cooled. This creates a partial vacuum in the power cylinder, which pulls the power piston back to its original position. At which point, the cycle starts all over again. Owing to the alternating transfer of air between hot and cold cylinders, continuous motion is achieved in the engine. Today, there are many applications for the Stirling engine. Its simple principle and design makes it an attractive low-maintenance option. And with air pollution and emissions such a major issue, the closed-cycle engine is experiencing a renaissance. Because it can run on any kind of fuel, renewables in particular, even biogas or sewage gas from treatment plants could be used as an alternative to petrol, diesel or the fuel originally used, coal. But the fuel doesn't even need to be combustible. Geothermal or solar energy can also be harnessed to power a Stirling engine. If the heat source is non-combustible, as in the case of solar, the system is totally emission-free. In terms of versatility, the Stirling engine is in a class of its own. In arid areas, for example, lots of mechanical power is needed to pump water and lots of sunlight is available. Here, dish Stirling systems are a particularly suitable technology. Fitted with a parabolic dish to focus the heat of the sun's rays, they use a Stirling engine to power a generator for the production of electricity. Thanks to this capacity to generate electricity from renewable resources, the Stirling engine faces a bright future as a machine for a clean world. Even very small differences in temperature, like that between the heat of a human hand and the temperature of the air around it, are enough to set a Stirling engine in motion. And as long as that temperature difference is present, it keeps on running. In contrast to internal combustion engines, with all the noises generated by explosions and ignitions, Stirling engines run very quietly indeed. This is because there are no pressure peaks in the operating cycle, a fact that also makes for virtually vibration-free operation and considerably extends the life of the engine. But the big argument in favour of the Stirling engine is resource conservation, which makes up for drawbacks such as slowness and low power to weight and mass ratios. So the time seems ripe for a renaissance of the Stirling engine. Even today, as in Robert Stirling's time, it could help make a considerable difference to the world we live in. <laughs>